Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our panel this afternoon. My name is Josephine Lau. I'm Executive Director of the Serica Initiative, and welcome to our panel discussion today of the documentary Far East Deep South. This has been a labor of love by many organizations who are co-organizing this together, and I'd like to introduce you to the organizations who've made today's event possible. So we're all here to discuss the film uh, Far East Deep South. This is a documentary that began as, as a personal journey to search for family roots by the filmmakers that ended in the Deep South and the Mississippi Delta. It's a story of the early Chinese American settlers, an entire community caught between the black and population. And the film looks at how being caught between black and white created a bridge for these communities. SubChina, um, our, our organization is a New York-based, China-focused news, information, and business services platform that informs and connects a global audience on the business, technology, politics, culture, and society of China. Serica Initiative, the organization that I head, is, uh, is SubChina's nonprofit arm. Serica's mission is to promote education and dialogue between the US, China, and the rest of the world. And we've also hosted a number of anti-AAPI events over the past year. Um, we'll be linking to those and also um, dropping links to the various organizations involved today in the chat box. Um, also involved in today's panel is a U.S. Heartland China Association, which is a bipartisan organization committed to building stronger ties between the U.S. Heartland. These are the 20 states located in the U.S. between the Great Lakes to the Gulf and China. Um, Min Fan, the executive director of the Heartland Association, is this was today's event was really Min's brainchild. She's traveling in the far reaches of China right now. She's deep into her quarantine um, and without reliable access to Zoom, but we're so glad and thank Min for all her hard work in putting this discussion together. Also involved is the Black China Caucus. BCC strives to enhance the presence and participation of all self-identifying Black professionals specializing in any aspect that furthers the holistic understanding of China. Last but not at all least is the China United States Exchange Foundation. We thank them for their generosity as our event sponsor for making today's panel possible. The China United States Exchange Foundation is an independent, nonprofit, and non governmental foundation committed to the belief that a positive and peaceful relationship between the strongest developed nation and the most populous, fast developing nation is essential for global well being. So um, we I wanted to start off um, talking a little bit about how some of our organizations um, came to develop a relationship as well. And I believe my colleague Jesse will be sharing a slide from the Heartland Association. Thank you, Jesse. So um, just kind of as a backdrop to um, our, our some of the collaboration between some of our organizations. Last year, um, when COVID started, uh, the Heartland organization was securing PPE donations for the Heartland communities that were most in needs. And donations poured in from organizations from both coasts, from across the country. The first donation um, that the Heartland organization received for their work was from was from Serica in SubChina, and it went to a clinic in the city of Greenville, Mississippi, which we've heard about in the Far East Deep South documentary as well. Many more donations came from other organizations, such as the Guardians of um, Angeles Foundation in LA and the Committee of 100 here in New York City. Today, many Chinese Americans and organizations like the Heartland Association are still working hard to help African American communities in need across the US. And today we have a real treat ahead of us. 
Um, we have a spectacular panel of speakers, including the filmmakers, who will be talking to us about um, this uh, about this incredible film and um, really digging into some of the race relations, bilateral relations, transnational relations that this documentary brings up. So really looking forward to a hearty discussion. Um, here with us today as speakers is Dr. Kristen Brody. Dr. Brody is a policy director of the Hamilton Project and a fellow of economic studies at the Brookings Institution. Dr. Brody was also a visiting faculty member at Jiangsu Normal University in Xuzhou, China during the summer of 2019. Dr. Keisha Brown is a co-chief executive officer of the Black China Caucus, and she's also an assistant professor of history at Tennessee State University in the Department of History, Political Science, Geography, and Africana Studies. And Dr. Brown is currently extending her research on Sino-African American transnational relations, which we'll be hearing more about. Also joining us, um, last but not least, our filmmakers, Baldwin Chu. Uh, Baldwin is a motivational speaker, rapper, he raps in Cantonese as well, actor and the producer of Far East Deep South, and Larissa Lam, a musician, television producer, and the director of the Far East Deep South documentary. So welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being with us here today and really looking forward to a very exciting discussion. Great We're to glad be to here. be here. <laughs> So for our audience, um, I hope you've gotten a chance to watch the film already, if, uh, if you have been able to. If not, no worries. The film link that we sent out when you registered for the event, it will be up until tonight. So the link does expire tonight. So do catch it um, if you're able, if you haven't gotten the chance yet after the event until tonight. And my colleague Jesse is going to be dropping links, as I mentioned, throughout the event. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to direct them to the Q&A box down somewhere here on Zoom. And we'll be, we'll be um, leaving time for Q&A at, um, at the end of today's panel. So first of all, um, Larissa and Baldwin, congratulations on such a powerful and moving film. Um, I know that I didn't know, um, you know, the, about the deep history of the Chinese community in the South, and it was, um, you know, as as someone based in New York, it was um, it was so interesting to hear Chinese people with such thick Southern accent, <laughs> and very culturally new to me, and it just you guys painted such a vivid picture of the deep and abiding bonds between the Chinese and Black communities um, in Mississippi at a time when both communities were being discriminated against by the white majority. And also speaking as someone from Hong Kong, um, my, my, fam my father's side of the family is from Guangdong as, as your family is Baldwin. Um, it was it was wonderful to hear your father's humor. There was something so <laughs> Chinese, so Southern Chinese specifically about it. It was wonderful, but really more broadly, the documentary was absolutely terrific and will resonate with um, Im immigrant communities, marginalized communities, um, so many different communities. In the in the documentary, you talk about. Um, I think it was your father, Baldwin, who mentioned the Cantonese expression gun in Mandarin Xungen to find one's roots. And I think that's a very universal theme that will um, that really crosses um, crosses nationalities, cultures, and um, and borders. So Baldwin and um, Larissa wanted to start with the two of you and talk about the film. Um, Far East Deep South is about your family. Tell us, tell us a little about your journey in making the film and why you decided to, to make this a film in the first place. Yeah, I mean, it, thanks for having us once again. I'm so happy to be here and glad to see. I'm excited to actually hear from both uh, Dr. Brody and Dr. Brown a little bit too. I'm sure there's gonna be a lot for me to learn as well. Um, but our journey really started off with just my, my daughter being born. You know, we, we, we really didn't know where our heritage was uh, because as far as seeing what my, my, my father hold her 
and you saw that in the film and it really got me to thinking well um uh, we we recently learned that my grandfather and great grandfather were in mississippi so if my daughter is you know like is 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 the first time i see my daughter with my father it'd be having that relationship we should probably just try to figure out and and go out to mississippi and look so um, this started off as just a home video. I, we had no intentions of making a film. We literally thought we were going to find two Chinese men, or at least I did. I, we both grew up in California, um, and I'm, I'm actually half Cantonese, half Shanghainese. So my, 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 father's, from, <laughs> my father's from Tongsan, and uh, my mom is from um, Shanghai, or they actually technically were both born in Shanghai. But um, so I just only knew of the more- Family <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, I only knew more about my immigrant experience and so when he said Chinese in Mississippi I just literally thought two men would be buried there his grandfather and great-grandfather so we took the trip to pay respects and you know for those of you familiar with Chinese culture paying your respects to your ancestors is, is a very, very important. important milestone and so um, we took a pilgrimage out there we thought we'd just pay our respects go home and that's and it we'll never it. go back to Mississippi again Get some pictures maybe you know and hopefully eat some good Southern food and then come back. Which home. we did. We got some we good cat fr cat, fried catfish. And actually Larissa's job was just to be mom because, you know, our daughter was only one years old at that time. And we we're like, how are we going to figure this out? And if we're going to figure this out and, and find this, then we just need, need her to just watch our daughter. And so as you, <laughs> as you saw in the film is pretty much what happened to our family. We show up um, in Mississippi, didn't know anything, didn't even know where the cemetery is. And then we end up hearing about the Chinese, the Mississippi Delta Chinese Heritage Museum, which was our first stop. And then all those revelations, one, the history that we all grew up, both of us grew up in the United States learning. We were both in AP history. Very good students, never <laughs> learned about the Chinese in Mississippi, but all learned about the American South, all learned about segregation. And that was mind blowing to me to realize that our community was also impacted by the same laws and that we had a place in the history that I'd learned all my life. And all of a sudden it felt like the scales had fallen off my eyes. And I'm like, wait a second, why don't more people know more about this? Because in my in my eyes, you know, I, my, I'm the daughter of immigrants and you couldn't get more American than the American South. And so for me to know that there were Chinese and other Asians in this south really gave me a stronger sense of belonging and that our history wasn't just building railroads you know there was so much more history to our community and so that that was really what compelled us so that our daughter wouldn't have to grow up dealing with some of the issues of belonging and identity you know that we struggled with growing up for sure and i think that sense of that sense of belonging i remember it was such a moving scene baldwin when you and your family found out that your um, Charlie Lou, so that would be your great grandfather was actually mm -hmm. born in the States and how much that moved both you and your father in tracing that, that lineage and history was so, um, was so powerful. Was there, um, what, what, what sense of belonging did you two come away with having made this film? Would, um, were there certain, were there certain circles? Were there certain mm -hmm. kind of, holes and gaps that made sense for you after from from the experience of making this film and learning more yeah. about family history well certainly growing up um you know the whole idea of me being foreign um was always with me because i wasn't sure when i was chinese and when i was american i knew i was chinese i also knew i was american but i always felt like i'm um, growing up i had to choose or people would choose for me when i was allowed to be chinese or when i should be chinese and when i should be american or am chinese or american so I think after this film was done and we learned so much more about our, our lineage, it really made me understand how much, I mean, we use the word belonging again, because that's really what it was, you know, being a perpetual foreigner um, mm -hmm. just basically means you don't belong here and you never have belonged here and you probably never will belong here. But when that lineage sh showed up and I looked at my daughter, I'm like, you know, it would be a shame for six generations later to have the same questions asked of her to people to look at her when she grows up and and also assume she didn't belong so i think after the film was done i, I realized that i don't have to choose um when i'm chinese or when i'm american i can be both at the same time all the time and that should be a common feeling that that all of us in our community should be able to feel 
Yeah. And I think for me, I grew up wanting to be blonde hair and blue eyed because that's kind of the model of popularity at my school. And, and the, all the popular girls were kind of that all American, quote unquote, all American girl. And what I saw on TV at the time growing up. And so I, I had a lot of what, you know, people would say is that self-hatred towards my own community growing up because I wanted to be the majority, right, which was white, um, and rejection of my culture. And I think through my life, and, and certainly the pinnacle of that would be going to Mississippi, um, you know, I, I finally, I think, understood that um, there was a reason why God made me Chinese American. I think it was to build bridges, um, but also the sense that, you know what, I do belong, even though my parents were newer immigrants, because even our language in our household growing up was othering, you know, like we talk about Americans, but when I knew my parents, even though they had been, Amer they've been in America longer than they had been in China, right, as citizens, but when I knew when they said American, they didn't mean us, you know, and when other people would say American, they didn't mean us, and, you know, if I go to Asia, the other, the other issue was if I went to Asia and visited my family in Hong Kong, then I was the American one, you know, I wasn't Asian enough, and then he, while I'm in the United States, working in entertainment especially, it's like, well, I'm not Asian enough here, or, or I'm American sorry, I'm not American enough. enough to. And, and so, you know, there's all these identity issues. And so I think when it, when we went to Mississippi, um, understanding how deep our roots were in this country and the history here really made a difference in my identity and feeling a sense of belonging. For sure. I think what um, both of you, Larissa, what you just said about neither kind of being between cultures, neither being American enough nor Asian enough, depending on the cultural context, Baldwin, what you said about um, the stereotype of Asian Americans being the perpetual foreigner. I know that one scene that really spoke to me was when you interviewed Congresswoman Judy Chu, and she talks about how the Chinese Exclusion Act is the only act in the history of the United States to name an ethnic group for exclusion to the US and how there's such a clear through line from the Chinese Exclusion Act to this very pernicious stereotype of Chinese and by extension, other Ch uh, Asian American communities being seen as a perpetual foreigner. And thank you again. I think your documentary does such a powerful job through the story of your family in grounding the AAPI community in this sense of history and belonging. So um, that was really fantastic. I think um, kind of going back to um, the stories that you dug up through the documentary itself, I found it so moving, um, Baldwin, your great-grandfather, Charlie Liu, um, during the depression, Black people were disproportionately affected economically, and your great-grandfather, Charlie, he extended credit to the Black American community. He gave people groceries from his store, and this really, a lot of his, these actions allowed them, allowed people to survive during the Great Depression at a time that white grocery stores weren't, um, weren't extending credit, weren't doing these kinds of things for their Black customers. Um, so I wanted to ask, from the conversations you had while making this film, um, what do you think accounted for this strong, perhaps unexpected bond between the Chinese and Black communities in Mississippi, do you think this is grew out of a common experience of being discriminated against in the segregated South? Were there other elements that tie tied them together culturally? I know, I know someone you interviewed talked about um, the common love of food, how um, the black communities loved eating rice, and then Chinese people came to love hog. Um, what do you what what do you think were some of the um, some of the bonds that tied these two communities so strongly together at the time. Yeah, I mean, certainly I would think um, one of the things is relationship. I mean, I mean we, we talk about um, their, their struggle and that, that's, that similar struggle forced them, forced both the Chinese community and the black community as well as you know, Jews and Italians at that time to all live in that same area, uh, which was predominantly black. So mm -hmm. um, that, that unfortunate um, scenario um, forced them to have to have the relationships with each other. But then that relationship grew and they knew how to be respectful to each other. And they understood that both of them in order to survive that time, um, they really needed to do something for each other. We actually heard from 
um, many of the, the older Chinese folks that um, when we get this misperception sometimes of the word credit, and I think some of the black community takes that word credit in the wrong way. And the way it's perceived today is different than when it was back then. Uh, there was no interest. Uh, there was no interest rate. They weren't functioning wasn't as a like, bank. It wasn't like a bank where you're getting like credit and then you're going to you accrue interest, compound it. It was a 0% interest. And, um, and they wrote people's names down on a ledger and second. it was this, an IOU. And if they didn't pay it back, they weren't going to come after you. And yeah. it was just kind of an honor system back there. So there was a there was a certain amount of trust between both communities um, to have this relationship. Yeah, and certainly the black community and the Chinese community needed each other at that time for that. So even if things didn't get paid off all the time, it wasn't like a big deal because they knew that they were still working through the hardships together. Yeah, and I, I think a lot of it, you know, as Baldwin mentioned, was you know, the circumstances of being shut out of white neighborhoods, um, being prohibited from living there. Um, and in many cases, you know, they, the white community didn't want to do business, go shop at a Chinese store. They didn't want, you know, the black customers to come into their stores, or in many cases, the Chinese coming into their stores. And so they had a symbiotic relationship. Um, and and one of self, I mean, we even heard stories in Baldwin's case, something that's not in our film that we discovered after we completed our film. There was a photo that was in Baldwin's father's, you know, family um, um, mementos. And it was, a, we ended up finding out that this man's name was Hosey Collins. He was a black gentleman. And uh, we knew he had been someone of significance because you wouldn't just keep a photo of someone. You wouldn't no even reason, take a photo because right? photos were expensive back then. Back <laughs> in those days. And we, and we found out that Hosey lived in Pace, Mississippi, um, where Baldwin's grandfather's store was. And apparently Hosey had a farm and Baldwin's grandfather, Casey Lou and Hosey kind of had this mutual exchange where Hosey would help Baldwin's grandfather in the store and Baldwin's grandfather would help Hosey on the farm. And so there was this wonderful relationship where they were, where they just obviously were other, just working with each, each, each other and helping each other just to survive. And, you know, hopefully they got to have some downtime and enjoy some fun things as well, like fishing. We heard that they loved, people like to fish. Your, your family liked to fish. Back when there was water <laughs> in, the, in the creek, the bogue. The bogue know. in the There back used to be the, water back there. A lot of fishing it stories. always brings people together. It's yeah. such a sweet story hearing about this beautiful friendship between Hosey and, um, yeah, and, and, your fam, and, and your family, Baldwin. So I know that, I mean, as you two have just talked about, at the time, some of these very strong bonds between the Chinese and Black communities in Mississippi were born out of symbiosis, out of survival, and that both communities were shut out by the white majority, whether it's from living in certain neighborhoods to going to white schools, even to um, both the Chinese and Black communities weren't allowed to be buried in white graveyards, which you talk about in the documentary. So um, there were these deep bonds that developed in the segregated South out of um, out of necessity and also out of um, out of friendship, as you as you both described. So I I'm interested, kind of taking us closer to the present day. Is your for the two of you, is there a sense, has this sense of affinity between these two communities, have they changed over time? Has the bond persisted? Has it faded away? What was your sense of this as you're going to Mississippi to, to film this documentary? Well, for some neighborhoods, you know, some of those bonds are still there. Um, I think partly it's a generational thing. You know, in fact, we were just talking to a woman named Sherry Williams, who family grew up in, a, she's, she's African-American and her family grew up in the Mississippi Delta. And we were on a panel with her and, you know, she was saying how her cousin still has a store, right, owns a store right next to a Chinese store in their town in Mississippi. And they are, they're like, very close relationship. They watch over each other's stores, have a very strong relationship. But we've also heard from some of the old timers, and this includes like both the black and the Chinese community, where they kind of say like, oh, a lot of the younger people, they don't know this history, so they don't have as strong of the bonds. Um, and so, you know, which is why I'm really glad we're having these conversations, because I think that's part of the issue. And even in, you know, even within the AAPI community, we don't know a lot of our history. So we don't know these bonds. Um, so it's very important and imperative that we continue to keep that history um, and bring that history, because currently it's not even in Mississippi. I mean, we showed an early screening of Far East Deep South to fourth and uh, to a couple of schools for a fourth at, through eighth graders. And these kids grew up and the are growing up in the Delta and 
this was the first exposure they had to this history. Um, and then later on, I mean, you know, the teacher who was, you know, older, she's like, oh yeah, you know, I, I never thought about what it was like. She was, she's African-American. She's like, I never thought about what it was like to be in the shoes of someone Chinese because they were, their family was going through all those struggles and she heard about all her family struggles. And I think it's very, it was very enlightening to know that there was this intersection, the shared history. And so, um, the older folks know the knowledge and those who've passed it down to their families have those strong bonds, but those who have it, um, there's certainly some education that needs to be done. Mm. And thank you so much. I mean, the, yeah, the documentary really memorializes and capture this very strong history that, as you said, so many of us don't know about. Um, Baldur and, La and Larissa, I have one more question before we um, turn to, you know, lots to discuss with Dr. Brown and Dr. Brody. Um, you know, as we just talked about, there are these incredibly strong bonds between the Black and Chinese communities in the 40s, 50s, before that. I'm curious to hear, um, and we're now, we're now living in a cultural and social moment where there's a lot of conversation, perhaps not enough, about relationships, relations between different communities of color and about allyship. Allyship is incredibly important at this juncture of social change with the Black Lives Matter movement, with the anti-AAPI hate work. And um, for myself, at least speaking from the Asian American community, which is more in our wheelhouse, there's not often a lot of reckoning about racism within the AAPI community itself, in particular anti-Black racism. I mean, just anecdotally, I remember, especially earlier this year, I was getting a lot of WeChat messages from Asian American group chats from people in China, um, you know, saying that, you know, a lot of making the erroneous conclusion that a lot of the anti-Asian attacks were being perpetuated by Black Americans, when actually about 70% of anti-Asian hate crimes have been actually committed by, um, by white people. So I think there's a lot of, um, there's, there's still a lot of anti-Black racism within the AAPI community that we tend to shy away from, that we don't always like to talk about or to examine. So I'm curious kind of within the context of all of this, what do the two of you see as your films main takeaways in 2021? What are the lessons for us to be better allies to each other as your um, as Baldwin's great grandfather and grandfather were for, for their black neighbors? Yeah, well, I, I think first of all, um, you know, one of the things that was important in making the film, which is why we included the black and Asian story was that shared history that I know growing up learning that history, as I mentioned before, in all my classes, all my history classes, as an Asian American, I would learn about slavery, I would learn about segregation, I would learn about civil rights. And, I, you know, I'd get the A on the, on the exam. And that was just head knowledge. I never felt a personal connection to that history until I stepped into Mississippi. Um, and I think vice versa, I think many people in the black community, a lot of our friends in having these conversations maybe never thought like they could, that our, our community could relate or even they could relate to our community historically. Like, again, that idea like, oh, you're just a bunch of new immigrants. It's totally different. And, you know, for people to hear about the, the systemic issues with the Chinese Exclusion Act and the racism that went all the way there that affected our community. But then also that intersection between the shared history with segregation in the South and Jim Crow laws, um, which were applied nationally in, in different, different ways. Um, I think that sheds, uh, that, that's a piece that I, I think is important for both communities to know. Um, and then I like your three Fs. My three Fs. What, go ahead and tell them about the three Fs. <laughs> like, you know, a lot of times when, when, when the Asian community thinks about the Black community, you're, you're either fearful or you're a fan of them, but you're rarely a friend to them. And it's, you know, so, and our example is, you know, you're fearful because you see some of these attacks, you see some of the, you know, and you're, you're, you're afraid that someone's going to, you see some of these. You buy into, you, the you buy into the perpetual racism perpetual, like, and black people are dangerous, you know, and you see, you see films that show black people as gangsters or, you know, and so, um, so you have that fear, but then yet people in China, all over the country, you know, we're going to basketball games, football games, and we were like, oh, I really love LeBron, and you know, like, and Oprah and Winfrey, Oprah yeah. Winfrey, you're watching her on Will TV, Smith, you know, right? you're Beyonce, big, you're big fans of them, right, but yet you're still fearful of them if they're not like those popular people, but then like how many of us like actually break bread 
with them. Like how, how many of us are taking them out to dim sum and making them eat chicken feet, you know, and uh, stuff like that. Like, you know, we love doing that, you know, food, food diplomacy is awesome, but like just getting together, talking about life. We don't even have to talk about racism. We can just talk about our daughters just going to school together. What's you, what, you know, what are you doing this weekend? Do you like doing this or not? Like how many of us actually break into real community with people in the in both communities getting together. And, and I think <clears throat> Bodlin hits on that that very well as far as the friend aspect is because I think that's where a lot of that anti the anti-blackness comes from. We're really grateful to have been blessed by a, a whole wide range of, of friendships um, from friends that are black. So when we see one news article that happens to have someone who's black who attacks someone Asian, we don't automatically go all all people that are black are attacking Asians and are bad because I look around at my friends and I think of all my friends and I'm like, they're not They like would that. never do. They would have you know, said I say <laughs> I think of that as the exception, but unfortunately not everybody has that exposure, you know, and just like you can, the reverse can happen. Somebody may have a bad experience with one Asian store owner and think like all Asian store owners are racist or, or, you know, cheap or whatever it happens to be, but that's not representative of the cross section, you know, of, of people across the United States yeah. or in, in, in one group. And so I think- and certainly we've heard that as well, you know, from the argument from people, some friends from even from the black community saying like, oh, I, I, I used to, people in, in K-Town used to always rip off my family. I don't even want to watch your movie about the Chinese people back in the day you know and so like that's that's because they had a the big experience in right? koreatown which again koreans are also different than chinese and so it's like right. everybody kind of generalizes and so i think the more we can have real relationships and between the communities um that we and there has to be an intentional effort on both parts to bring our communities and understanding together and, and we really hope our films that's one of the takeaways is like here is a platform where you see the intersection um in a positive light you know, where people can have these conversations born out of it and realize they have more in common than they do different. Mm -hmm. For sure. I think um, exposure, friendships, real relationships really are the foundation to, um, and the antidote against stereotypes, as you two are saying, and that is really the foundation to allyship. And we encourage everyone to go out and eat chicken feet and engage in chicken <laughs> Uh, chicken feet diplomacy. Yes. Uh, and, um, that is always a dim sum way. diplomacy. Dim sum diplomacy, best, most delicious way to, to build bridges. So um, speaking of building bridges, we're go um, going to kind of um, shift our focus to Dr. Brown's work um, for, for a second, whose work focuses on building bridges from a slightly um, from a related but slightly different perspective. Um, Dr. Brown, you've spoken on um, to two Stop China podcasts, uh, both on our Seneca podcast and also the New Voices podcast, which um, I strongly encourage all of you to check out. Um, Dr. Brown had um, incredible episodes on both of these podcasts. Um, you, you've spoken to us about your work at the Black China Caucus, about the underrepresentation of Black academic journal, um, and journalists in the China watching space. Um, for those of uh, for those in our audience who might not be familiar, can you um, can you tell us a little bit more about the Black China Caucus and what you might see as the main you know some of the main causes of Black underrepresentation in China studies and how the organization is working to to uh, to address this and accomplish its goals. Thank you for those questions and apologize for raising the raise hand function. I was trying to do something else and it popped up and I was like, oh no. So <laughs> it was a very awkward moment. I was like, no, I didn't mean it. <laughs> but I have a lot of ingredients from a Tennessee State University and HBCU and it's talked about college and university um, here in Nashville. And I always want to say uh, welcome uh, from the land of, of golden sunshine. Um, for those of you who may or may not know, I also uh, decided to in the pandemic as if um, the world was not enough on fire and I didn't have enough to do. So I also co-found the Black China Caucus with uh, Mark. And so we started um, via a phone call in March 2020. And that in some ways morphed into us talking about our experiences as um, Black uh, professionals in the China space, him in kind of more government work and me more so in the academic space and from that we decided to say let's put out a 
a, a, a survey to see we wanted to, people in the database. And then we put out the database questions and people actually, we got so many responses very quickly and we realized there was a whole community there. We felt for so long that we were by ourselves because sometimes in many spaces, you might be the only one in that particular space. You might be the only one um, at your job, in your department, in your um, graduate program, or you might be one of a handful, but you don't know other people are out there. And so what we tried to do after we got so many um, overwhelming responses to the database where it grew uh, exponentially to where I think at first, the first couple of months we had about 75 people, then it grew to 100. And now we're almost, uh, we're almost at 200 in all of uh, a little bit over a year. And so we realized that we're building community. And so what the Black China Caucus is doing is we focus on um, professional development, um, folks who want to, you know, get new skills or they have to pivot um, or when they want to change careers with the ideas that we're creating community and doing community resources. But I think the communal building is one of the biggest aspects because people are realizing they're not by themselves and it encourages them to stay in the work that they're doing because it can be very difficult if you feel as if what you're going through you is just you and you start to doubt things You to say, well, is it just me? Am I imagining things? Was that a microaggression or was it just a little bit? You start to question everything. You find ways where you're asking yourself. And so we've created a space that allows our members to come in and be the authentic selves, but we also focus on professional development and try to do things that appeals to what our members want to do, but also to signal to the China Watch community that we are here, we have been here, and to bring us into these conversations or to bring our perspectives into these moments. But if you don't, we also going to bring our own perspectives in our own platform. And so I think that's one of the biggest takeaways for the Black China Caucus is that um, giving each other support to continue to do the work because we all have our own stories about how we got to China. We all have uh, similar anecdotes about our experience in China. We all like, oh, it happened to me too. You had that experience. Oh, that's funny. And we know, but it also kind of gives us a way to bond and say, okay, well, let's keep pushing forward and support each other in the work that we're doing in our respective fields. And so our members, they range from academics to government to artists, you know, who are creative, who are people who are doing, I mean, there's a range of fields. And so that's one of the biggest uh, takeaways of the Black China Caucus is the community that we're building. But also we have a database where as of, uh, we're getting uh, more calm, more, uh, more uh, questions that people are asking us for, can I interview your, you know, you have a member who does this topic or this topic. And so there is a change where we see where not of people know that we are here and they know where there is a database in the community. They're also asking to seek out our members uh, to be part of some of these panels and participate and really expand the conversation about how we think about China because, you know, if we can't have one particular view of China, um, China is not a singular place. It's not a, a monolith. Um, it is a diverse place. And we need to also make sure that we have diverse perspectives and experiences to reflect that, especially in this moment where the bilateral relationship is kind of in this, it's very uh, precarious position. Right, for sure. And I think it's so interesting that you're you're making that connection between the need for diverse di diverse voices for China, especially at a time when I think um, you know the U.S. and China are really kind of retreating into caricatures of each other. So that kind of diversity of perspective is so important. And thank you so much for the great work you're doing and introducing us to the Black China Caucus. Mm -hmm. Dr. Brown, so I know that the BCC is um, one aspect of your work. Another area that um, you've also looked at is how Blackness has been historically perceived in modern China. And I know that um, you've written a piece for Harvard about how traveling in China um, inspired you to research this. And you've looked at really interesting things that um, I know, um, you know, I really got to, to learn about listening to your podcast and reading your work. You've looked at how China understands the Black foreign other through how African Americans navigated and negotiated their time in Maoist China. Um, you've written a piece, which I referred to earlier for Harvard, um, called Teaching China Through Black History. Um, I wanted to ask, can, can, you can you tell us a bit more about what your research has shown you about the perception of Blackness in China? I know that's quite a broad question. <laughs> it is. I will try to do my best to address it. <laughs> um, so one of the things is that uh, my dissertation 
um, research looked at Maoist China specifically 1949 to 1972, um, but also in doing so, it also engaged with um, early 20th century perceptions to see what was different about Maoist China. Was it something, was it a shift? Uh, were they engaging in uh, preconceived ideas that were always there? What was it about this particular period? And the reason I got into that is because I, uh, in my graduate work, I was learning about uh, the cohort of African-Americans who were going and traveling to China. And going back to uh, what was uh, said by Al Bawa and Anne Larissa was that you learn history. We learn in cold, you know, US, US history, cold war history, no Americans can go to China. It was closed off. China was closed off. Nixon saved us and China opened up in 72. That's kind of the narrative you're told, right? But then when I started doing my research, I was like, wait, this person is going in 1955 and this person is going in 1968. And you have a whole cohort who are going prior to Nixon's visit. And so I was like, wait, there's something that's, uh, that's disconnected here. And that's really how I got into that research itself was looking at individual narratives who are people who are going to China, who are African-American and why choose China in that moment? Like it's not, you can't go. They were having to actually be creative in how to get to China because they're coming from the US. They couldn't take direct flights. So they're going and doing all kind of, you know, extracurricular ways to get to China and going and making all these different travel routes. And so what about China was this space? And so there's quite a few scholarship that talks about the Black radical imaginary and how China was part of this and looking in that moment um, where you have this international dimension of the civil rights movement as well. What is this international dimension? What are other countries doing? Are they supporting us? Do they have different models that looks differently at these questions as well? And so China was part of that conversation, even though it was a communist country. Country, people were like, well, why China? China was in some ways engaging with them, especially Chairman Mao at the time, who's releasing speeches and saying things as well. And so that period of uh, uh, looking at that was interesting. Um, it's a little bit different uh, from the pre-Mao uh, period because Mao was very much about political building relationships. How do we think about our foreign our relations and how African Americans are part of this goal? But pre-1949, a lot of it was through cultural um, exchanges, uh, through literature through music. And Dr. Brown, I mean, you spoke about kind of China's support for civil rights at yeah. the time. I remember going to the Propaganda Poster Museum in Shanghai, and there were these incredible Maoist posters expressing solidarity yeah. for the for the civil rights movement in the yeah. U.S., and just incredible to see. Yeah. I wanted to, I mean, kind of jumping off on that and mm -hmm. kind of circling back to what we talked about with um, Larissa and Baldwin earlier. Mm -hmm. They talked about um, kind of Asian American perceptions of, of African Americans. You've been talking about perceptions of, um, of Black Americans mm -hmm. in China itself. So there are these different layers, right? One, there are the relationships between the diaspora, between Chinese Americans and Black Americans, as Baldwin and Larissa explore in their documentary. Mm -hmm. There are the transnational relations um, as you just talked about at length, perceptions of blackness in China, China's support for civil rights um, back in the day. And obviously these are relations that um, continue to evolve. Um, and I think, I mean, at Saracens of China, we've done a fair amount of work on both of these levels as well, kind of, and how these intersect, right? In terms of the AAPI community, thinking about how Sinophobia, the US public's growing distrust of China, how that's shaped perceptions of Asian Americans in the States. So there's kind of this fluidity between how diaspora are viewed domestically, how, um, how, how you know, race relations play out back in, in the motherland, if you will. Um, what are what are your what are your thoughts on how these two levels? in terms of relations between the Chinese American and black American diaspora mm -hmm. and the level of transnational relations. Um, how do you see these relating to each other and how these two different levels inter interact and intersect? Um, so I guess a lot of my work looks at in some ways in the China space specifically, but I can try to talk about um, the Chinese American experience, even though that's not necessarily my uh, area of research. But one thing I realized is that there is a connection between the, the Chinese diaspora. Um, if we look at those kind of conversations, if we look at the role that China's playing as this kind of new global China, um, China has more engagement with Black uh, people globally. And so how does that translate into ideas and exchanges with the Chinese American? Uh, we'll think about that, that, uh, that avenue, that arm of the Chinese diaspora. How does that relate? I think one of the things that makes the 
American experience a little bit different is because you are also at the immigrant experience. What does that mean? And how that's a different level of engagement. But I think in terms of transnational, these conversations are being had where if we look at recent moments of what's happening in China, where I would just say briefly, these three scales, you have the government, you have the um, academic kind of the intellectuals, and you also have the individual. And these in some ways are not in conjunction or talking to each other. Where you have, for instance, the CCP saying, you know, putting out posts and tweets about we support Black Lives Matter. Then you have academic institutions doing more research about uh, race and talking about blackness in different spaces, but then also the individual level where it's not necessarily having these connections. So I think there's a lot to be done in that particular space, um, but also in the transnational space as China is growing, in terms of its influence globally, there has to be another kind of conversation about as you're moving to these new spaces, how you're going to connect those three different levels in a way that makes these ideas kind of have a conversation so that we don't have what we had last June, where you had this huge anti-backlash against individuals who are living in like Guangzhou and things where they were being discriminated against. So again, how do we get to a level of engagement to where it's, you're doing the research, you are making these things, but how they're in some ways still feel quite disconnected from the realities and the every day way in which these ideas are perpetuated how do we break through that mm -hmm. and I think a common theme that we've just explored in today's panel from the three of you so far is kind of this drawing these connections on a day-to-day -day level on a personal level to some of these larger social issues that we're all grappling with Dr. Brody um over to you and um my apologies so I had um since Dr. Brody has such an illustrious uh, CV, I had gotten her title wrong um, earlier. Dr. Brody is a fellow in the Metropolitan Policy Program at the Brookings Institution. So um, thank you again for being with us. Um, Dr. Brody, I wanted to um, kind of talk to you on a personal level, speaking of kind of personal and um, broader levels. Um, as, as we talked about earlier, you were recently in China before COVID. You were a visiting faculty member at Jiangsu Normal University in Xuzhou during the summer of 2019. I know the before times can feel quite far away these days, but I'm um, just really curious to hear what, um, you know, what either your personal observations or kind of more, more broader insights that you might have had from your time in China, what did you observe about how, um, how the mainland Chinese perceive Black Americans today? So first of all, thank you for having me. Um, I just want to say, um, like Dr. Brown, I'm also affiliated with an HBCU. Um, I am a professor of financial economics at Dillard University in addition to my work at Brookings. Um, so I, I went to China through um, a partnership with Alabama A&M University and Jiangsu Normal University. Um, I would also like to say that I, I went to school in Mississippi. I went to Alcorn State University and Jackson um, State University. Owned property there, spent lots of time. And I think as much as people think of, of the South as being racist, and, and I'm not saying that it's not, but I did not experience racism in Mississippi. I mean, maybe it was because I basically lived in a Black community affiliated with other Black people. Um, but I, I was never called the N-word ever in, in, in my whole life in living in the United States. The first time I was called the N-word, and I'm not going to say the word, but was in Shuzhou, China. Oh, wow. um, I, um, I stayed at a hotel because um, the, the dorm room that was provided for me at the school was completely insufficient. I mean, it was, there were giant insects. It was in the basement. It was like the worst room possible. Um, I was there for five weeks by myself. The dean of Alabama a and came for a couple of days at the beginning. Um, he got there like two days after I got there. And when he saw the room, um, he literally picked up my bags himself and said, you can't stay here. That's how bad it was. And I, I, I wanted to leave, but I, I had dedicated myself to teaching this, this international um, finance class to students from 25 different countries. It was an international program. And so I had to pay cash to stay at a hotel. And so happily enough, I had like $3,000 cash with me. Um, and I had exchanged quite a bit of it before I left um, at O'Hare. I could not exchange money in China. 
I went to the Bank of China. Um, and I, I think people find this surprising. I've talked to people that said maybe they didn't understand me, that the Chinese are not racist. And I'm not saying that all of them are by any means. But I went to the Bank of China. Um, I went to the Agricultural Bank. And not only would they not exchange my money, but they would not speak to me. It was, it was like the racism that my grandfather talked about growing up in Mississippi in the early 1900s. He was born in 1913. So I'm standing there with $2,000 in cash. And the people there acted like I didn't exist. It wasn't that they didn't understand the language because I wasn't saying anything, right? I'm, I'm, after a while, like I asked, I used my translation app to say, I have this money, please help me. Like I, I was afraid I was gonna run out of money and not be able to pay for my stay. And I walked up to people and they literally like paid me no mind. I went to the grocery store and um, some children ran into me with their cart and I fell. Like ran into me hard, not like an accident, like ran into me um, and laughed and the mother laughed and other people laughed at me. I went to KFC. I generally ate at KFC or Pizza Hut because that was the only thing that I could eat that wouldn't make me sick. And at KFC, they're standing there laughing. There were several workers. And I had no idea. I'm looking around like, what are they laughing at? And one of them pulled up the phone and said the N-word oh. and showed it to me, right? Because I'm thinking maybe there's a different word that they're trying to say. So they, they looked at up yes mm -hmm. on the trans that's that's how i would order my food i would use the translation app to say you know two piece whatever and i would show it to them right and so i had gone there a couple of times um because it was right next to my hotel and so this particular time when i came in they were they were laughing and so i'm like they can't be laughing at me like what is going on and so several of them started saying it and i ended up walking a mile to pizza hut because the the general manager of the pizza hut was very friendly to me and he spoke English. And so from then on, I would walk that mile to Pizza Hut because he was one of the only people that would serve me. And it wasn't just in Shuzhou, um, in, in Beijing, I couldn't get a cab. When I went to the, to the train station, and it's, it's hard to talk about, but I, I feel like people need to know this. There's a long line, people, you have to wait like forever when you get off the train to be able to get a cab. And so I have my bags, and as I'm walking by, I hear the cab drivers locking their doors one after the other. The same thing happened in Shuzhou. When I went to Shanghai, it was a little bit different, but, and, and I want people to understand that from Beijing to, to Shanghai, it's like a, a 12 hour car drive if you were driving, um, a six hour express train ride. And so Shuzhou is the halfway point. So we're talking about a 12 hour distance I traveled this 12 hour distance. I know China is a huge country, but I traveled that 12 hour distance and everywhere except Shanghai, people would step off the sidewalk. I had people throw things at me. I had people spit in my direction. And I'm there trying to teach, not, not like about African-American history, not English, but international finance. <laughs> and it was the worst experience and the best experience that I've ever had in my life. I've never been so isolated. I've, I've never experienced such racism, not anywhere else in the world. And I've traveled around the world. But through that, um, I became more resilient. And, and so I think that, um, that conversations like this need to happen because discrimination definitely goes both ways. Um, I know that Chinese Americans are discriminated against and that is terrible and unfortunate and nobody should be discriminated against. But I would just say that I've, I've never experienced anything like it anywhere else in the world. Dr. Brody, thank you. Um, thank you so much for sharing your story and um, my heart goes out to you. So, so sorry to hear that you had to hear these words that you were physically attacked. As you said, nobody should, that should never happen to anyone and no one should feel that way. And um, thank you so much for being here today and sharing your experiences with us. Um, 
Based on these experiences, I'm going to ask this as a last question before turning to audience Q&A. Um, were there times when you were able to have productive conversations with students, with friends that you made in China? Were there, were there conversations around race that you, you hopefully, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing you nod, that you were able to have? What do you think could potentially, what do you see as a productive way forward for people in mainland China to, um, to perhaps develop a more nuanced understanding of some of these issues and for things to yeah, So I think with the students being from so many different countries, Rwanda, Ghana, Zimbabwe, um, Kazakhstan, um, they were from places that, that I never thought I would meet anyone from. And so they shared some of their experiences about restaurants or shops where people were kind to them and, and places that, you know, they would advise um, African-Americans or, or Africans particularly not to go. Um, and I think with the faculty members there, I was able to tell them about some of the experiences and they shared some of the stereotypes that they had heard um, because they didn't- Were they shocked at these stories or were- Yeah, I think they were because I guess with, with media being so closed there, they the people that I encountered um, weren't seeing movies or they didn't have access to social media, right? So their, their perceptions were very limited. And I'm not saying that's everywhere in China. I'm just saying the people that I encountered. Right. Um, and so at first they were kind of in denial. But then as they, they shared the story, you know, with their family members or their friends, they were surprised by the reaction. It was like, wait, you have someone Black teaching? You know, and so when, when they talked to, to their friends and family um, and heard those things, they came back and apologized and said, you know, even though I didn't have that perception, I met someone who did. And I was able to correct them to tell them about you and why you're here and about the students. And I, I never thought that I even needed to do that because they never thought that, that the people in their circle felt this way. And so I think just through my presence um, that maybe a few minds were changed through, through mm -hmm. conversations like that. Um, I still communicate with some people through WeChat. Um, I actually made some friends there. So I, I feel like um, some minds were changed. Thank you so much again for, for the work that you do and for sharing your experience, Dr. Brody. Um, and thank you so much to all of our panelists. And just, we have just a few minutes um, left in our panel. There's just so much to discuss and I'm sure we can go for another hour, um, but we are getting to the top of the hour. So I'm gonna try to dig into what we can from our audience Q&A. The first question is about um, the Far East Deep South documentary. Um, Helena's wondering, um, She's interested in Casey Liu, Casey Liu, who is Charles's great grandfather. Oh no, your, your grandfather. Um, his wife and his other children who remained in China. And from my understanding from the film, um, at, the at the time, Chinese women weren't, there were Chinese men who were working as laborers in the US, but Chinese women weren't. Um, weren't allowed into the United States out of stereotypes that they were prostitutes, um, et cetera. And um, the question is to is posed to uh, Larissa and Baldwin. Have you been able to trace that history as well of Baldwin's grandfather's um, wife and other uh, children who remained in China while the men were working yeah. in the States? So we have, uh, I did meet my grandmother. Uh, that would be my, my dad's mom, Casey, Casey Liu's, Liu's wife. wife. I met her once uh, when I went back to Hong Kong for the, when I went to Hong Kong for the first time just to visit. So I met her once and I believe I met uh, my father's sister uh, one time as well when I went out there. So that's, that's about the uh, extent of it. Um, the unfortunate thing with the Chinese Exclusion Act is that uh, first of all, it, it, it didn't just exclude Chinese people. Uh, which it obviously did and other Asian people, but it excluded our history, but it also um, lasted a long time. And so the reason why my grandfather, Casey Liu, uh, wasn't able to bring his family over was the same reason why it took so long for Charlie Liu, my great grandfather, it took him so long to bring over Ms. Liu and Casey to come over. It took him almost 17 years uh, to finally get them over. Uh, so 
that the unfortunate thing with the Chinese Exclusion Act, it did extend multiple generations. And so, um, you, you know, have an aunt. Yeah, that was that was in China. Um, yeah. But you never met her. I, I did meet her once. Oh, you did. Yeah, yeah, my dad's mom. Yeah, And I think at the end of her film, we say so Baldwin's dad, after he left um, China to come to the United States, only saw his mother and his sister one, one time. last time. Yeah. Um, so my dad did not go with me to China when I met them. I went with my mother. Right. Um, and so that's why I was able to meet him. Yeah. Uh, but my dad had to stay back in the U.S. to take care of my brother at that time. Yeah. So I did want to I just quickly jump in. Dr. Brody, um, thank you for sharing so candidly about your experience. And I'm so sorry you had to experience that. But but certainly those types of sentiments are, is, is a reason that we hope that there's an opportunity for a film like Far East Deep South to go be exposed to China, because we know somebody Chinese may not want to watch do the right thing or Ava DuVernay's like latest like documentary you know or any black filmmakers you know uh, film but they will watch a story about a Chinese family that happens to share about the African-American experience and hopefully that builds some more empathy um, and ties um, to, to for an understanding between our communities. Absolutely. Um, I think I'm going to end on um, one last question also directed to Baldwin and Larissa about your family history. And I know um, the documentary itself gets into some of the origin story of your family. Um, have you, Baldwin, have you learned why your great, great grandparents came to the U.S. and how and why your great grandfather went to Mississippi. I think it was quite a um, you know unexpected uh, discovery that your great grandfather was born in the U.S. Um, were you able to find out a bit more about that part of your family history? Uh, the most we could really calculate from the numbers, um, like the years and stuff, was we we assumed that my great great grandparents showed up in the 1860s um, and. Back then, that's before 1882 Exclusion Act, so there wasn't really any immigration laws per se. Uh, at that time, it was kind of like, um, you know, people were brought in for, and, and America was being built. So they were most likely brought in to help build America. They were cigar workers. Yeah, based on the documents that we found in the National Archives, it did list his great, great grandfather during the interrogations. Um, his great grandfather, Charlie Liu, had mentioned that his father meaning his great great grandfather worked in a cigar factory and um, I had found a census document that I think may match his name that actually confirmed that that said that it was cigar factory I mean the majority of the people were like railroad workers but um, that stood out because name, yeah. it was cigar factories and there's so many other industries that people don't realize that the Chinese worked in besides you know just, just the railroads, railroads um, all around basically the western half of the United States or even even beyond that, there were all so many industry logging, you know, yeah. farming, uh, fishing, um, and then cigar. That was that was the first time we were exposed to it. But apparently up in the Bay Area and San Francisco, um, there were quite a few Chinese that were recruited to work in to make cigars specifically. Yeah. And so my grand my great grandfather made his way to Mississippi, most likely also because around that time in the 1870s, you know, right before 18. 82 Exclusion Act, a lot of the anti-Chinese sentiment was starting in California. There's a lot of riots going on yeah. that, again, most people don't know about. A lot of people don't know about the mass lynchings of Chinese people in California. Um, so California was not a great place for Chinese people to be when you're getting close to that 1882 uh, time frame. So uh, my great-grandfather made his way through the Southern Pacific Railroad, most likely, along that path uh, to make his way into Louisiana, La Baton Rouge, New Orleans, uh, traveled his way up into Memphis, where uh, you know, like the business hub was, and then trickled his way back down into Mississippi to different Most, little cities. And yeah. we know all this because of the National Archives. We didn't get a chance to include all of this. Uh, we originally had a map that tracked this, but yeah. <laughs> ended up cutting it because it, it it made the film a little bit too long um, to watch. Yeah. all this stuff it's, it gets complicated right yeah. um but we do have i mean that's the unfortunate and silver lining 1880 exclusion 1882 exclusion act terrible thing to happen the silver lining is it did create a paper trail of history of course baldwin would trade that paper trail to have have had his dad you know be reunited with his family but we do actually now know um how he got from san francisco all the way to Seems. mississippi yeah yeah. Like, can I add maybe one point really quickly? Sorry. Yeah, please. So to talk about the um, the rampant uh, discrimination, there's a great book by um, Mary, uh, Beth Lou Williams called The Chinese Must Go, where she talks about the lynchings, the fires, all those things happen. And then also there's a great book by uh, Mu Ho Jong that talks about the ways in which, you know, post-emancipation, 
um, before you know the sharecropping system at the beginning of sharecropping when black farmers were organizing they actually built in memphis a whole trade network and organized had a whole trust company and so Mu Hong Jun talks about how they bought in Chinese workers and then once they're asking about questions about citizenship that's when it became a problem hence the exclusion act and Etli Wong has a great book about comparative racialization as a citizenship who can be an American so those are three sources I would recommend if folks want to look in those they kind of tap into all these questions about how it's happening all these different conversations in the same time in one place and what's happening in this space when you say Memphis Memphis was the hub for this new trust company we're trying to build. So that was just my last thought. Sorry. Thank you. Sounds like a great resource. And um, Baldwin, Larissa, that's, there's, sounds like you unearthed so many materials for this film that you have more than enough for a second, third film ahead of you to tackle all of these really important issues. Um, since we, we are over time, I wanted to thank all of our distinguished panelists today. Um, thank you so much for your time and generosity and staying with us over time as well. Baldwin, Larissa, congratulations again on this incredibly important and powerful film. Dr. Brown, thank you so much for telling us about the work of the Black China Caucus and really drawing out the importance of diversifying, of amplifying Black voices in the China watching community. Dr. Brody, thank you so much again for speaking so candidly about your experience, your personal experience in China and giving us a glimpse of the reality of um, you know, what, what it can be like to as a, as a black, black person in China on the ground today. Um, a, lot of, a lot of thorny issues, a lot of work to be done ahead of us. I um, take heart and take hope in the beautiful film that um, Larissa and Baldwin have made and how it really traced the moving, very real connections between the Chinese and Black communities in Mississippi. Thank you so much again to all of you. The documentary is called Far East, Deep South. And again, the film link is available until tonight. So you still have a chance to catch it if you haven't gotten to see the film. And thank you so much again to our partner organizations and to our event sponsor as well for making this possible. We'll be sending out a follow-up email from this, um, from this event. Thank you so much for joining us again and we look forward to seeing you soon. Bye everyone. Bye everyone, thank you so much. And feel free to connect us with us on our website, fareastdeepsouth.com. Mm -hmm.